Hello, uh, well, welcome everybody to this session on uh, profiling, micro-targeting and a right to reasonable algorithmic inferences. Uh, m my name is Will Scrimshaw, I'm a Director of Corporate Affairs uh, at Microsoft here in Belgium. It's a great honour to be a chair for this uh, really exciting discussion this morning. Um, over the last few days, the topics of, of profiling and micro-targeting have been discussed on a number of panels. Um, today, we wanted to focus in, in particular, on the role and impact of the use and generation of inferential data. Algorithic, algorithmic inferences can lead to new intrusions into people's privacy and may be difficult to understand, verify, or refute. This panel will discuss, among other things, how inferred data should be reasonably used and protected. We have a great lineup of panelists, so I wanted to briefly introduce everyone and then we can jump right in. We'll follow a similar format to most of the other panels you've seen over the last three days uh, with some introductory remarks from each speaker and then a moderated Q&A. Our first speaker is Dr. Sandra Vachter, who's a lawyer and research fellow and assistant professor in data ethics, AI, robotics and internet regulation at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford which is a mouthful, <laughs> but, uh, as well as fellow uh, at the Alan Turing Institute in London. Uh, we'll then hear from Dr. Swati Gupta, who is an uh, assistant professor at the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering of the Georgia Institute of Technology in the US. Uh, and then next up is Ravi Naik, a partner at UK law firm ITN Solicitors, uh, focuses on data rights and technology, and is the UK Law Society's 2018 Human Rights Lawyer of the Year. And then we'll hear from uh, Federica Kaltheuner, who leads Privacy International's programmatic work on data exploitation and who you already have been fortunate enough to see on a panel yesterday uh, on AI and privacy by design. Um, and last but no means least, uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Ben Wagner as our moderator today. Ben is an assistant professor at the Institute for Information Systems and Society at uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business. Um, he's also a director in pri of Privacy and Sustainability Computing Lab. So with that, uh, it's a great panel and, and excited for the next hour and a bit. Um, I'll ask uh, Sandra to, to come up and kick things off. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I'm very excited Oops. Uh, to be here. I'm gonna do this this way. I'm too short for this. Um, yes. Yeah, so, the, um, the topic of my talk is a right to reasonable inferences, and the, um, the talk is centered around a paper that um, I published with my colleague, um, Brent Middlesex, a couple of months ago, um, because we got interested in the question of what kind of legal protections we actually have against inferential analytics. Um, and yeah, it's a very long paper, um, so I can only give you the, the cliffs of what we, what we found. Um, but the paper is publicly available if you're interested in looking at it. It's, it's 90 pages, so I have to apologize for that. Um, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I published a, a smaller, more digestible piece in, uh, in Nature, which is called Data Protection in the Age of Big Data, which has, uh, is complementary to that piece and is a, a shorter version of that if you're interested. But um, what those two pieces have in common is that I got very worried about how inferential analytics is currently being used. And just to give you a couple of examples. Um, so for example, here we have the example of, of Netflix that are able to infer race on your viewing habits and to use that information to tailor certain uh, content to you, nudge you into clicking on, on a specific movie because they infer that is something that you might like. Um, similar here with Facebook who have been, uh, you know, in, in the media quite a lot recently, and that's an example where they are able to infer sexual orientation to uh, use it for targeted advertisement, but they're also able to infer uh, race and gender, political views with um, what we have seen so far. Um, another interesting example is here, um, actually from Microsoft Research, where they showed that based on the interactions that you have with, your, with their search engine, they're able to infer if you might suffer from Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. And the last example here is uh, Amazon that recently filed a, pat a patent um, in implementing uh, software in uh, Alexa, which should be able to infer your health status based on your speaking habits or speech recognition. And then they might offer you um, 
uh, medicine based on that. So the, all those things can be seen as very sensitive information, very um, privacy invasive potentially, inferential analytics. And that causes concern because when you interact with those platforms, you actually never revealed that information to them, but they might be able to infer something about you. And because it's a privacy question, I got very interested in the question of whether or not inferences are actually personal data. Because if they are, we do have quite a lot of protection um, in the GDPR, for example, or other pri privacy frameworks that could be very helpful. So, in the paper, that's the stuff that we looked at. I don't have time to go through all of them, but um, those are the privacy regulations and the trade secret stuff that we looked at. But most interesting, we did look at the case law, and that's the stuff that I want to be talking about. Again, the main question is, are inferences personal data? Why is it important? If they are personal data, you could have, among other rights, for example, the right of access. The right of access would mean I can go to a data controller um, and ask them, uh, what kind of data they're holding about me, what kind of inferences they draw about me, and could potentially obtain a copy of those inferences, which could be very interesting. Another right that you might have is you might have the right to rectify it. So if you feel like that you're being profiled and inferred in a certain way that you don't agree with, you could use that to rectify it, which could be a very powerful tool. Okay, so what we did is we looked at um, what the Article 29 Working Party says and what the Court of Justice says on that. And the question is, I don't know if inferences are personal data. Um, it's, in my opinion, still unsettled, and I think we need to keep that in mind because it's problematic. So we have here the Article 29 Working Party's guideline on the definition of personal data, and they actually have a very generous um, definition of that. They say anything can be personal data that is either about a person in terms of content, is being used to assess a person, so has a purpose to assess a person, or has impact on a person. So the result um, impacts on the individual. And of course, um, subjective information, opinions, and assessments, including inferences, could be seen as personal data. Then we have two judgments that I want to mention that are not in accordance with what the working party says. We have here, um, in 2014, an interesting judgment from the Court of Ju uh, Justice um, regarding an immigration law case. Somebody was uh, applying for legal residency and the person was not happy with the outcome, wanted to have uh, information about the legal analysis, so the way that the person has been assessed um, by the institution and exercised the right of access, right of rectification. The court said here, the legal analysis, you know, an inference, in, is not personal data. In fact, the court said that only facts about a person can be personal data, which is a very, very limited view on that. Even more important is that the court also said that the remit of data protection law is not to make decision-making processes transparent and accountable. That's not what data protection law is supposed to do, which is, to me, kind of counterintuitive. And the court also said that if you do feel that you have been assessed unfairly, the right of rectification wouldn't help you there because you as an individual are not the competent authority to assess whether somebody else assessed you accurately. If you do have a problem with how you're being assessed, you would need to go to the next higher authority. Data protection won't give you that. So that was very troubling. Then we had another judgment in uh, 2017, a 180 in terms of what the court said. Um, that was a case that had to do with somebody that failed a professional exam. And here the court said, completely different, that everything can be personal data if it's about the content, the purpose, what has an effect on a person. And of course, opinions, assessments, inferences are personal data. It comes with a small caveat because the court also said that just because something is personal data doesn't mean you get all the rights attached to it. You have to interpret it according to the telos of the regulation. And that means, in that uh, particular case, that yes, the inference, the assessment that was drawn about the person is personal data. Doesn't necessarily mean you get the right of access. Because what the court said is that the examiner who took those notes, it's also his personal data. So you have the examinee and the examiner who shared that personal data. So it's not very clear who went out um, when it comes to court. And that could be problematic, so it's not an absolute right in that regard. And most importantly, again, the court said, you have no right to rectify an assessment, 
um, that's not something that is in your power. If you have a problem with how you're being assessed, you would need to go, for example, to an exams board. Again, that makes sense because it would be the next higher authority. So just to, to sum it up, uh, we have conflicting and uh, uh, interpretation of the remit of personal data. Working party says anything can be personal data. All the rights in the GDPR are applicable. And the remit of data protection law is to make decision making accountable and fair and transparent. Court of Justice, not clear if inferences are personal data, but even if they are, it doesn't mean that the rights automatically apply to it. And finally, and that's in at least three judgments of the court, said that the data protection law has not the purpose to regulate the content of decision making. If you have a problem with how you're being assessed, you would need to find a sectorial law that applies to your specific case and find recourse there. That makes sense in those two cases, but we have to keep in mind that very often we don't have any recourses against how decisions are being made about us, right? We leave it very often in the private autonomy of decision makers, how they make decisions. We don't have a right to get a job or insurance or go to university, so very often there is no procedure in place where you can complain and data protection won't help you there. Sometimes the decision makers are bound, for example, by anti-discrimination law, but formal procedures in terms of what is being used to assess you is not often in place. So that is a problem. Um, with the examples that I gave you, you will realize that a lot of the information is actually sensitive, right? Uh, and the question now arises if GDPR gives you more protection against sensitive inferences. With the examples here, Netflix and um, Amazon, Facebook, those are all sensitive inferences, and we know that those kind of data deserve more protection. And we do have here um, Article 9 in a GDPR that actually has a very sensible wording because it says that not just the data that directly reveals something that is sensitive, but also data um, that indirectly reveals it could be considered sensitive information. So again, we looked at what the court thinks and what the working party thinks, and again, there is a bit of a conflict here. In my opinion, working party very sensible understands the idea that sensitive data can be sensitive by inference as well. However, the court sees it a bit differently. This was an interesting judgment uh, where somebody wanted to have access to the names of the personal assistants of members of parliament in the European Union. And those people said, I don't want this information to be disclosed because if you know who I'm working for, you could infer my political affiliation. The court said that's not enough to make it sensitive data because first of all, you would need to have the intention to infer this information and second of all, the data that you're gathering has to be reliable to infer that. And they said just because you're working for somebody, for the Green Party for example, that's not reliable enough to infer that you are affiliated with that or that you agree with those views. Now, that's kind of nonsensical in terms of big data because if you're using, for example, proxy data, postcodes, who are strongly correlated with race, um, sexual orientation, gender, you don't need to intentionally infer that. It's going to be baked into it as well. And the reliability question, that's also a bit nonsensical because it doesn't really matter if you're correctly inferring someone's race or gender. The problem is that you start treating people differently. Right? You are inferring that somebody is a woman or is, has a set, certain political belief and then you start treating them differently. It doesn't matter if the assumption that you're making is actually accurate, the problem lies somewhere, somewhere else. Okay, so that's um, the, the uncertain legal status of, of inferences. Again, it could be the case that the court sees it differently in the future and I very much hope it will happen. But even if the court sees it differently, another problem remains and that's the problem of trade secrets. So again, I told you um, that we actually have a very powerful tool, which is the right of access, the ability to go to any data controller and ask them, what kind of inferences are you holding about me? The caveat is here that you're only gonna get a, a copy of that information if it does not adversely affect the rights and freedoms of others. And rights and freedoms of others could be trade secrets. And we have this wonderful new framework here now, which is the Trade Secrets Directive. It came into force um, last year as well. Um, which has a very, let's say, generous interpretation of what a trade secret actually is. So let's look at that. A trade secret is anything that is not known, anything that has commercial value, or where reasonable steps have been taken to keep it secret. So that's a very broad definition of a, of a, of a trade secret. 
And that could mean that, among other things, you know, customer data, information about credit worthiness, um, personal pricing, life expectancies, code model, business plans, algorithms, could all be considered trade secrets. So even with a very generous interpretation, and I think a right interpretation to think that inferences are personal data, we still need to think about how we balance that with trade secrets if they get so much protection around that. And this is exactly why we wanted to say we believe we need a right to reasonable inferences. I think we need to think about how data protection works in the, in the age of big data and think about um, how we can deploy those system, systems in a reasonable way. So again, I'm not talking about all kinds of inferences. This has nothing to do with um, you know, harmless inferences. I'm talking about the very privacy invasive inferences, the ones that could be reputational damaging, the ones that are being used for very important decisions, loan decisions, employment decisions, those kind of stuff, right? Those kinds of decisions are being made about us. There we need a reasonable assessment standard. And it's very important that we're probably not gonna have a one-fits-all solution. What is reasonable will very much depend on the application and the sector. So thinking about reasonable assessment in criminal justice, health, insurance, advertisement. That is, I think, the next step forward to think about what is reasonable in those sectors. So we proposed um, an idea here, which is an initial idea, um, to, to think about that um, and think about sectoral justification in a way. So we need to have a very public and, and good discussion about what kind of inferences are actually normatively acceptable to draw. Is it acceptable that you infer my sexual orientation to um, give me advertisements based on that. Is the data source ethically acceptable? If you do that, is the data that you're using reliable? Do you have any statistical proof that this is actually a good predictor for what you're looking for? And if you don't have that, you should have an, uh, this should be explained to you and you should potentially have the right to contest that. So that's the idea here. Um, I'm gonna close by saying I'm a very big fan of, 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 of big data and AI and I think there's a lot of potential for our society here. But I think it's very important that we not just think about what's technically possible, I think it's also essential that we think about what's reasonable. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming to our panel, and uh, thank you for having me here and inviting me for this panel. I'm uh, Swadi Gupta, I'm an assistant professor at Georgia Tech, and uh, after Sandra's wonderful overview of uh, uh, a lot of the articles and a lot of uh, uh, legal regulations around what's a reasonable inference, what's personal data and not, uh, I wanted to give you a, a sense of uh, sort of just a quick review of how we build machine learning models so that we can also think of the problem from a technical perspective. So the first thing that I want to say is that, you know, so machine learning models, as we all know, work with a lot of data, chunk that, uh, crunch that data up using algorithms and make decisions for people. And the thing we are interested in is what is the effect of these decisions on people in terms of profiling, micro-targeting, and uh, the right to reasonable inferences. And I'm going to move slightly here so that I can see the notes. Um, okay, so machine learning and AI automates human decision making. So when we think about making an algorithm, we go through a process where we're trying to build a world or we're trying to build a reasonable view that the algorithm can see from maybe a tiny pinhole and model people in a certain way. We find patterns in, in, in this model and so that the algorithm can look at a large amount of data, find some patterns, generalize those patterns, uh, augment that worldview. And after this process has, gone, gone, uh, has uh, uh, been done for multiple different aspects of what, it, what the problem is and what is the decision that we need to make, we optimize the decisions, we optimize certain uh, metrics or we optimize certain uh, uh, goals that we want to achieve using an algorithm, and then we make decisions, right? And uh, when designing algorithms, a lot of thought goes into what we want the algorithm to do and how we can achieve this goal. The bulk of the inferences drawn from data about people are either so that we can inform the algorithm about the state of the world, which is only visible to 
us through a tiny peek hole into the real world or so that the machine learning system can inform other parts of the model where to look for solutions. And this is something which I will talk about in a little bit about building blocks. So let's start with an example. So if I were to look, I if I were to build a search engine, uh, the question that I want to answer is, how can I find top 10 items? How can I sift through a million web pages that might seem relevant, and within a blink of an eye, if not faster, give the most relevant pages to a person to view them. We want an automated method to do this, and one, way, one question that we need to answer before we can do it is, what does a person like? And we try to find proxies for what a person likes or what's most relevant to a person. And one proxy for that is the click-through rates. So if I show you a bunch of pages and you click on a few of them, then that's the proxy that I can give an algorithm that you know maybe this person liked these pages that were shown to the person. So that's click-through rates is a proxy that we are using to build the world. Finding patterns means that you know, we are looking at what people similar to a particular individual or what people who are looking for a content, so these are called content-based models or collaborative filtering models that sort of try to find patterns in what other people like us looked for and what people who looked for an item then eventually liked. Right? So either go through the item-based uh, context or go through the person-based context. And uh, even find patterns, even try to make reasonable assumptions of where to start the cold start problem for. So where to start when you have no data? What might be a reasonable search result to show when I search for, uh, let's say, a bat? Should it be a cricket bat? Should it be the animal bat? Should it be uh, the baseball bat? And so on, right? And this already runs into, and, and this is used to make decisions, but this already runs into the profiling problem. Because now, we are trying to profile people into different buckets. We are trying to uh, see that you know this person belongs to this bucket of customers, this person belongs to this bucket of customers, and this is already where we are drawing inferences and sort of, uh, it's another form of discrimination in some sense, right? And, and we are trying to sort of show them a, a narrow worldview. But if we don't do that, how are we ever going to achieve the, uh, trying to find the best preferences or the best items which are sort of appropriate to a person? So that's where some of the tension lies in sort of non-profiling and profiling customers and sort of using models uh, that build on each other. And for search, for instance, I wanted to go through a list of proxies quickly uh, that come in uh, various applications. The highlighted ones, so the purple and the red ones, red ones are where they're clearly legal uh, uh, problems uh, with sort of their privacy invasive and they're learning very uh, sensitive gender attributes, sensitive attributes about a person as Sandra was just talking about. So for search, I could think about click through rates, reviews, ratings as a proxy for what a person likes. When I'm showing advertisements, I want to show advertisements that are appropriate to a user. So one could think about you know, the search history, the IP address, which is already uh, slightly uh, 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 shady, uh, gender, race, away from home. So that's something that Facebook was using, for instance, uh, for targeting advertisements, which, was, uh, which received a lot of slack from the media and public. Social network for advertising is, again, uh, problematic because then it can sort of restrict opportunities that are available to different sections of society. Pricing, uh, so you can look at historical demand, you can look at location, you can look at the assortment of products that was shown to a customer, or you can look at an assortment of products that customers typically buy. When you go to a grocery store, you might have your favorite set of products, and when algorithms sort of map, sort of track which products you've bought in the past and which products you're moving towards, they can infer certain things, and this is the famous uh, target example where they infer the pregnancy of a teen, and uh, that ran into uh, legal problems. Routing, so one can look at congestion on the roads, usual travel patterns, predict where you're going next, which might be great for an application that's, uh, that's sort of telling the user that you know, this is the route you should take best, this is the best route that you should take, or this is where you can stop for a grocery uh, on, in the middle of your route. But then again, they're inferring data about the patterns of uh, human behavior. Uh, road condition was another problem where uh, there was an app and that sort of gave um, the, uh, that sort of gave data on the bumps on the road 
for only in preferential neighborhoods because people, uh, only a few people had access, sort of had the means to download that app or knew about that app. Uh, hiding is another example where you could think about various proxies that one could use and for credit as well, where you could use various proxies. Some of them uh, are known to have run into legal problems with some applications and some of these proxies, but from an algorithmist's perspective, these proxies are uh, great to tell the algorithm that you know this is the view of the world. We want to find people uh, when we are looking at resumes. We want to find people who have done when, when well in their college or who have been great on some some teams. We are looking for certain markers, and when we are writing an algorithm, we try to transfer those markers into proxies and develop models that can sort of inform our decisions. So with that, I want to. Um, then argue that uh, data generates metadata. So machine learning models are sort of, they look like this toy. They're built one on top of each other. Uh, the data from one, the sort of solutions from one data are fed into another model, they become the data for that model. And this data becomes metadata and that data, that metadata becomes data for another block. And what happens in all of this way, I, I uh, list down a few of the uh, techniques and few of the sort of the components that go into a real world machine learning system. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is feature extraction. So when, let's say you have the algorithm has some data on uh, me about uh, where I live, where I work, where my degree is, uh, where, uh, what type of websites I go to visit, what time of the day I browse on the internet, uh, what type of groceries I buy. So I, the algorithm has, let's say, some of this data, a narrow slice of the data into my life. And now the algorithm will run, let's say, a neural network and uh, will get some vector sort of a representation, uh, representation in terms of numbers in a very different space that is not interpretable in terms of whether it's race, whether it's uh, education, whether it's location, in any uh, tangible sense. So we lose a lot of meaning of these features when models go from one to the other, and uh, uh, feature extraction sort of, we lose all interpretability when we're extracting out features from real world data. And I wonder if this is where inferences can also uh, sort of like, how am I doing on this? One more minute. Okay. Uh, okay. So inferences can also be drawn from metadata. And here I want to specifically uh, point towards inferences where we've run algorithms on the data in some sense that we've collected from users and metadata that we've crunched through users. But we've run algorithms or analyzed social networks which are uh, uh, in any way, very important in understanding the interactions of the world to build better systems. And one might ask, better from whom? But at least the goal is to drive our society into a, a fairer, a more efficient um, world. And inferences, so here I show a social network. And the, the way the links of the social network or the uh, weights on those changes over time that sort of tells us that can be used to infer how the relationship status of a person is changing or whether they're sort of introducing them to more friends. And this can be useful in sort of improving the quality of the news feed. But again, this is something that is inferred and that's very personal to our lives. And uh, I wonder if that's uh, sort of reasonable from a uh, legal perspective or not. And uh, Target's example, I already mentioned how pregnancy was inferred based on the assortment of products that the teen moved to. Uh, Cambridge Analytica case, I, I suspect Ravi will talk more about it, so uh, let me not. And uh, detecting suicidal depression, uh, that's something that is, uh, I think Sandra mentioned that briefly in terms of neuro... Uh, inferences uh, that can be drawn from data on the web searches if somebody has societal depression or not. And we can argue whether these things are uh, sort of reasonable or not from a uh, legal perspective. And uh, facial recognition has been used to you, uh, sort of detect, sort of infer whether somebody is criminal or not. And that seems like a wrong premise to start with. And so here I am pretty certain that you know this is something that is not reasonable. All right, so learning what is efficient, uh, I, since I don't have much time, I'll just uh, sort of say that, you know, in inferences, one can think about data, one can think about metadata, and inferences that we are learning to improve the efficiency of algorithms to improve the quality of searches. But another important part is the optimization that the algorithm do does when you're interacting with the model. And uh, this is the case for the automated experiment on ad privacy settings, where uh, Google, 
like if you're, let's say I'm a search engine that's trying to show job advertisements to users, and somehow women start clicking on lower paying ads as well as high paying ads, men click on only high paying ads, the search engine learned to optimize. So this is just a mathematical efficiency that any one of us, if we were selling products to people, we would have learned ourselves that uh, women sort of, uh, now the search engine learned to show women only lower paying jobs and men uh, only higher paying jobs, which is clearly unethical when we view it as if effect of the consumers, but that's a ma uh, mathematical efficiency that was learned by the model. And similarly, Amazon, when they decided to uh, uh, service all neighborhoods of uh, Boston, let's say, except Roxbury, which is a predominantly African-American neighborhood, uh, this could be just due to efficiencies in terms of the costs of routing to different neighborhoods. And uh, this was not uh, something that was specifically uh, discriminatory to start with. So, uh, in another work, so this is what my group is currently targeting on, on learning what is efficient and trying to find unfairness or bias in algorithms. And here we start with some data which is from the census tract, uh, the government data, and the redder dots are people with higher median household income, the lighter dots are people with, uh, who are sort of below poverty line. And uh, here we wanted to route some commodity that's depleting over time to consumers so that uh, they don't stock out of it. So you can think about vegetables or you can think about water in vending machines. And uh, the only assumption we made here is that poor people have a smaller holding capacity than rich people. I'm sorry when we optimized here, for this. We've gone massively over time, and please, everybody else would also like to speak, so it would be great if you could come to a conclusion like we asked you to yes. five minutes ago. Just one slide That's more. what you said five minutes ago. Yes. Please, okay. come to a conclusion. Uh, and what we realized was that the customers who are below poverty line, they stock four to five times more than customers who are above poverty line. So with that, uh, let me not go over potential solutions, and that was the summary. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, um, we've not got much time, so I'm gonna just try and get through this quite rapidly. So I just wanna break down the idea of reasonableness. Because I'm a lawyer, I'm gonna pick on one word and try and break it down. Um, I'm breaking down reasonableness into two concepts. So the concept of fairness, and secondly, the access to information. And firstly, why am I gonna talk about fairness instead of reasonableness? Well, reasonableness is not a term of art within the principles of processing, within Article 5. The first data protection principle is that data is to be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. And fairness is necessarily an amorphous concept and a context-specific term, but it's nevertheless a key ingredient to good decision-making. There's a well-known judgment from England um, in the case of Doody, where Lord Mustall said that fairness will very often require that a person who's adversely affected by a decision should have the opportunity to make representations on their own behalf, either before the decision is taken with a view to producing a favorable result or after it's been taken with a view to procuring its modification or both. And the intensity of the obligations will obviously vary depending on the facts. In Doody, that was a case about the review of a life sentence for murder. Um, and those, those remarks were qualified. Nevertheless, it shows fairness is not abstract, but it can have some tangible teeth and real meaning. And I just want to explain one of my own cases where we looked at fairness um, and how it works in action. We acted for a guy called Michael Segalov in a challenge to Sussex police. Mr. Segalov is a really well-known journalist in the UK. He writes regularly for The Guardian, Vice, and other very well-minded uh, publications. And he's very well-known amongst the Labour Party and the progressive left. And he sought accreditation to attend the 2017 Labour Party conference so that he could interview politicians, many of whom he had interviewed before, and exercise his democratic rights by hanging out with his Labour Party chums. Unfortunately, the police denied him accreditation to the event. No reasons were provided to him, and he was not allowed to appeal. So we were instructed to sue and challenge that decision. Or, as one blog put it, it's my party and I'll cry slash sue if I want to. Um, and a key challenge that we brought was challenging the fairness of the decision. Just the basic fundamental point that, as a bare minimum, a person affected by the decision should have the opportunity to make representations concerning how that decision was reached. And the court agreed with us and stated that our client should have been given an opportunity to make representations as a ba uh, basic matter of fairness. And in finding in our favor, the court balanced both the effect of the decision, the deprivation of his ability to work, against the burden on the police. But further, 
we argue that the first data protection principle was breached in respect of fair processing. And the court agreed, and they stated, to the extent that the defendant's conduct was contrary to public law principles, it was also a contravention of the first data protection principle. And by aligning fairness from a public law perspective to fairness in a data protection context, the court set an important marker for the proper use of personal data. In contrast, and my second point is a clear example of unfairness, Cambridge Analytica. I'm sure it's a well-known case that I don't need to introduce. Uh, we acted for the renowned data uh, rights activist, Professor David Carroll. We were instructed to sue for profiling of our client and the micro-targeting of him on the basis of his political beliefs. We considered the targeting to be unlawful as far as it was his sensitive personal data that was being processed. But to understand the extent and the breadth of his uh, claim and the profiling, we sought to access his information. He completed a SAR and got some information back. We sued for disclosure and we complained to the DPA. In response the I to the ICO, Cambridge Analytica told my client that he was no more entitled to make a subject access request than a member of the Taliban sitting in, the ca in a cave in the remotest corner of, of Afghanistan. It's an incredible company, eh? But they were obviously wrong as a matter of law and the, they were prosecuted in January and pleaded guilty. Um, I was gonna go into that in a bit more detail, but I'll skip through that maybe in Q&A. But that shows two clear examples of how fairness and access can be used in action. Um, I could have also gone through a few other cases, such as the CAT judgment from the European Court of um, Human Rights. I just want you to understand that these principles can be tied to real world examples and you can have a real tangible impact. And the question I guess we're gonna all face in the immediate future of everyone in this room and at this conference is how those public law principles will apply in a technological context. Thank you. I hope that was quick enough. That was perfect, thank you so much. If anybody has any examples of the Taliban making data access requests, I would love to hear about them in the discussion, so please. I'm waiting for that instruction to be honest with you. <laughs> Yes. I just want to start by saying, uh, what's the purpose of civil society? Because there seems to be some misunderstanding of our role. So our, our job is we work in the public interest. And when it comes to topics like profiling, our job is to advocate for better laws and protections, to make sure that the guidance which accompanies these laws offers the strongest possible protections for people. And finally, we also need to make sure that people who break the law are being prosecuted and that the law is being enforced in the strongest public interest. Hmm. Oh. So what I'm about to say is based on two publications that we wrote on this issue. On the left end you see this is our submissions to the Working Party, Article 29, and their guidance on profiling automated decision making. It's also based uh, on our analysis of the role of artificial intelligence and privacy. When thinking about profiling and automated decision making, we use the following framework, and I think it is crucial to make a distinction between profiling and automated decision making. There is a huge focus on a very, very narrow aspect of this problem, and that is everything that falls under Article 22 in GDPR. We think this is just a very tiny proportion of the decisions that have important privacy implications. Uh, and as uh, Sandra argued so eloquently, data protection principles do apply to both decision making and profiling that does not fall under Article 22. So we think in our submissions to the working party, we do think that Article 22 should be interpreted and applied widely, but regardless, there's profiling and automated decision making to which data protection principles do apply. And in fact, I believe from a privacy perspective, profiling uh, presents one of the greatest threats to privacy that we have yet to wrestle with, with because it blurs the line and the distinction between what is personal and what is not personal data, what is sensitive and what is not sensitive data. Here's just a tiny example. We um, published research where we compiled recent academic studies that show what kind of things can be inferred from seemingly mundane data. And here are just some examples, religious, political views, ethnicity, happiness, etc. All of these things can be derived, inferred, and predicted from data that have nothing to do with these inferences. 
All of this is very theoretical, but in practice, uh, the usefulness of GDPR will depend on how it is being enforced in practice. And since we are working in the public interest, this is exactly what we're doing. In November 2018, we have filed complaints against a number of companies, uh, Axiom, Criteo, Aquifax, Experian, Oracle, Quantcast, and Tapad. So these companies are data brokers, credit referencing agencies, um, and ad tech companies. Um, so the complaints are based on three things. They're based on 50 access requests we made. They're based on an analysis of these companies' privacy policies, but they're also based on their public marketing materials. What you see here is, are the data that I received in response to my access request to Quantcast. This is a significant chunk of my browsing history. It is linked to a unique identifier. In that case, it's a cookie ID. What we also obtained as part of this access request are inferred data. In fact, what you see here, this is my inferred gender, whether I have children, my education, my income, um, etc. And what we've also obtained in response to this request is a lot of partner data from other data brokers, companies like MasterCard, Experian, all of these also put me into segments that were then linked to a unique identifier, uh, a, a cookie ID that was linked to a browser. This is a company that took a very different approach. This is Experian, um, and, and sort of like the basis of our complaint is that a company like Experian has two very different lines of communication. In their marketing materials, their argument is that we can uniquely target individuals, and we can link all these segments that we create to unique individuals, but in their data protection policy, or in their data policy, they say, well, we actually, uh, we can't give infer data to you because this is not linked to your identity. Um, so companies take a very different approach at the moment, and I think um, there are basically two reasons that our complaints are based on. On the one hand, we found that there's a recurring abuse of legitimate interest for the processing of data. Um, and the second thing, and this is why I mentioned this in, in the context of this discussion, is that um, profiling pl plays a really crucial role in our complaints, in that we believe that in a lot of cases, uh, basic data protection principles, transparency, fairness, purpose limitation, data minimization, ac uh, accuracy, as well as the need to have a lawful basis have not been met by these companies. And in some cases, companies even claim that the inferred data is, does not constitute personal data, even though their marketing materials suggest something that's very different. The reason why we focused on data broker is that uh, the working party in its guidance mentions data brokers several times. In fact, profiling is the core business model of data brokers and ad tech companies. And this is why we urgently need enforcement action and why we need decisions that clarify the extent to which the law applies. So here are next steps. Um, what we need is we have heard from DPAs. DPAs are, have taken our complaints into account. In fact, we haven't officially filed a complaint, but we have asked them for an assessment notice. Um, but what we need is we need an enforcement action that sends a very clear signal to companies because what we're seeing is that they're applying the law very, very differently, and that's a, that's a problem. Secondly, we need uh, precedents that clarify ambiguities in the law. Again, we hope that this is in the, in the public interest and that uh, this happens in a way that protects people. Um, but also, I think we've only scratched the surface. This entire complaint is based on access requests. It's based on publicly available information. That's the bare minimum what we could find. So we encourage other people to do similar investigations and to also file complaints. And then lastly, I think we haven't really focused that much on the scope and applicability of Article 22. And I was very curious to learn that in, a, in response to Edry, Facebook claimed that none of its processing falls on the Article 22. And I think that's very curious. And this is something that definitely needs to be challenged as well. Apologies, there's a technology failure now. <laughs> but that's the last slide anyways. Thank you. Thank you very much for four very fantastic presentations that I think give you the whole breadth of the debate and also the technical dimensions, the civil society dimensions. I'd just like to ask perhaps the people who weren't presenting directly on the right to reasonable inferences, do you believe, both of you, that this is something that we need, or you as well? Is this something, do we need a right to reasonable inferences? Is that something that's missing right now? 
I think one thing I haven't mentioned, and if you look at the data, if you look at your personal data and the inferences that are made about you, the consequences and the urgency of this becomes very apparent. The data that I've received from Qantas is blatantly incorrect. I've been classified as a wealthy man. This might or might not be used to my advantage. And even with all this data, I have no idea who this data is being shared with. And it's also important to remember that Experian, um, the company that we filed the complaints against, this company was involved in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. They're part of the ICO investigation. So there are vast consequences and the argument that Facebook uses, coming back to Article 22, that none of their uh, operations fall under the article, is that the guidance says that usually targeted advertisement does not have significant effects. But I think this shows, well, I'm not so sure. And especially, I love the examples of discrimination that both of you mentioned, because there are clear examples where this is not the case, and we urgently need clarity on this. But I just think there has been an obsession for a long time on the explanation part, and there are so many other dimensions to this. This is why I haven't focused on it that much. So from a practicing lawyer's perspective, I think Frederica is right that it's, it's really helpful as a theory, but actually getting accountability is going to be the most important thing. And the way to get accountability is through explaining what, getting an explanation, so getting access, like we've seen with the Cambridge Analytica case, but also then holding that profiling or the ill effects to account. And I think until we start having cases in court explaining the legalities and the contours of legality and what's permissible, then we're going to, we're going to be, we're, we're a long way short of having uh, tangible, proper legal precedents at the moment. We really need to start moving that forward. And I think our case against the ad tech industry, on behalf of Brave and Open Rights Group and Michael Veal is going to be really important, as well as the PI work on the, on the data broker industry. I agree. I think that's really valuable. And I also think it's important to consider from a technical perspective. Like, could a right to be reasonable inferences from your technical perspective be implemented? Is that a reasonable perspective, not just in the legal context? I think it's a it's a very reasonable right to ask for, and I uh, actually very important because the inferences that are drawn from a particular application, if they're specifically used for uh, life-changing applications like credit or job or hiring or uh, some access to opportunities where things are not even shown on a search uh, result that should be uh, that would actually be very beneficial in sort of uh, uh, being more successful or being more happy. Uh, I think in, in those terms, uh, the right to reasonable algorithmic inferences is super important, and uh, we should be thinking more about that. But I, th I feel like uh, it has to have some. Uh, uh, it has to come with some some uh, some qualifications. And I guess that would also be the question for me, just before we open it up to the whole floor, to try to understand a little bit. So on the one hand, we have this huge accountability deficit of like existing law and the GDPR not even being properly implemented. And we're already talking about the next right and what's coming in future. Yeah. So how can that be combined in a way that actually contributes to meaningfully protecting rights right now, both technically and legally? What do you think? Yeah, I, I actually don't necessarily think we need to establish that right as in we need a new law to do that. Not at all. I actually think, and I agree very much, that the tools that we have available could be used for that. As you just mentioned the, the right to rectification and how inferences are being drawn about you that are not accurate, right? If you use the right to rectification to do that, we would already be a step further down the line. I think the way we thought about the right to reasonable inferences was more to go back to the original meaning of privacy. Right? Um, we, we talk about GDPR and data protection and it's all just focused on data protection. I think we keep forgetting that it's not about protecting data, it's about protecting people yeah? and the people that stands behind that specific data. And if you look at what privacy means in the, in the bigger meaning, if you look at the jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights, privacy is very much about identity. It's about self-presentation. It's about engaging with other people. It's about to, write, to change your personality, right? And all of that has to do with inferences. If all of a sudden my personality is being made up by algorithms and I have no way to know about that, to assess that, to rectify that, then that core right is getting eroded. So my idea is that the right to reasonable inferences would be already be protected in the broader realm of, of privacy. What I want to see in the future is when a judge sees that case, interprets the law with that framework in mind, right? Not just about is the data being held securely, did you get consent for it, like all those very 
very narrow focus is, but think about what are the privacy identity implications for that person, and then applies the law with that framework in mind. Please. Just, just a quick thing to add on to that. So for, from a perspective of a practitioner, the way a, a, a court looks at this, we don't use just data protection regimes, we use the panopticon of torts and everything to try to protect privacy and all the facets that privacy seeks to protect. It's, it's about personal dignity and your own right to make choices. But we can't get there until we have a right to access and that tends to be the problem with most of these cases, particularly where data controllers either say, I'm not the controller, if you find the controller, then you can maybe come back to us or you just get nothing at all. Or it's protected by trade secrets, right? Mark Schrems had a lawsuit a couple of years back where he had an access request and Facebook told mm. him they can't give him his data because it's considered a trade secret. Right, right there's, there's all sorts of games they try to play. I've had it with one company, I won't list name them, but there was two lawyers, they tried to say, oh, you need to sue the Irish uh, leg of this company, not the British. And I said, okay, can I speak to the lawyer? And he said, oh, wait a minute, put the phone down. And his friend called me who sat next to him and then gave me the answer instead of like just giving me direct access. It's just such a bad way of thinking about privacy and data rights. So if you look at the Quancast data, um, you can clearly see that it's an inference. There's a confidence interval. But where's the trade secret component? And also, in that specific case, where's the added value of me knowing the formula behind it? It's not really, I, I, I know it's probabilistic, and by virtue of being probabilistic, it's inaccurate a lot of the time. So the, the deeper question is, when it comes to very sensitive uh, inferences that are used to make decisions of significance, is it ever okay to use to rely on probabilistic reasoning? And I don't think it is. And the explanation itself is not the remedy. The remedy is, I need to be aware of the fact that I am being profiled in a certain way, I need to be aware of the context in which it is used and the people with whom these inferences are being shared with and whether or not it leads into significant decisions. And even having, knowing the, the interval that Quancast gave me, I don't know. I have no idea how MasterCard data ended up in this, uh, in this targeting. And, and it's also not my, it is my job, but it's also not my job in the sense that that's what data protection law requires companies to be transparent about. I think that's a very good point. Just because we're a little bit short on time, I'd also like to open it up for questions from the floor. Is there anybody who would like to jump in, please? Here at the front and over here. If you'd just like to get to the microphone and then you can start asking questions, please. The floor is yours. Hello, Winfred Feil is my name. Um, I'm a little bit shocked that no one on the panel even mentioned once uh, an opposing right, a potential opposing right to uh, the right to inference you just talked about uh, 60 minutes. Uh, and that is the freedom of expression. Um, to judge other people, to think, oh, he's trustworthy, she's beautiful, uh, is the most normal thing in the world, what we have done for thousands of years. And, um, um, and it, it, there, is, there is jurisdiction about um, judging others um, for decades um, in at least in Germany, by the, by the civil um, courts. And um, just one example, um, credit scoring. The highest federal court in Germany said the credit score by a company is the result of freedom of expression. And um, yeah, you have then to do the normal balance of interest. Um, and that is the reason why the German law said value judgments in credit scoring are different thing than personal data, but you have, in this specific case, a right to access to this value judgment, to this credit score. So I realize you'd also like to be a panelist. Is there a question in this? Or The question is, why don't you see the um, opposing rights? Why don't you see that freedom of expression might be threatened by what you are talking about? Thank you very much. Next question, and then we'll collect all together. Please, at the back. Thank you. I'm not like a scholar, so this I is really like the ignorant student's uh, question to the professor. So in my rudimental understanding of data protection law, it's uh, even if the inferences are not personal data, so maybe I don't have certain rights <laughs> like access, still some protection from uh, unreasonable inferences, I 
thought will come from the purpose specification of the processing of my data. So if I give uh, some company my data and their stated purpose is, uh, I don't know, to process my credit score, uh, isn't that a violation of purpose specification if they uh, make inferences about my, my, I don't know, health uh, status, at least to the extent that it's unrelated to the credit score? So could you please explain this? Perfect, thank you. At the back, please. Uh, I'm Dennis Hirsch from uh, the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on one of the comments made about reasonableness perhaps being related to fairness uh, and the idea of thinking about this reasonable inference as a fair inference. And I think that does some important things for us here um, because an, an, an inference can be fully accurate, let's assume it is accurate, and still be problematic or unfair. Let's take the target inference of the girl's pregnancy. That was accurate, um, but it still arguably was unfair. So I think this reasonableness notion needs to go beyond accuracy. And I also think in response to the comment made before, that if you think about reasonableness in terms of unfairness, then it's not all inferences that are problematic. Uh, it's those that are unfair. And I know that you know there is doctrines of unfairness, commercial unfairness, that in the United States can be implemented fully consistent with the First Amendment. So I think if you narrow it to unfair inferences, then you really address, in some ways, this freedom of expression problem. I, I, wanted, I do have a question, and I wanted to relate it to a panel yesterday that I think was very related to today's panel, maybe draw some lines between them. So yesterday's panel was on notions of fairness, both in the GDPR and also in commercial unfairness doctrine, existing laws on commercial unfairness, um, which arguably, it, both in the EU and the commercial unfairness directive, I believe, and also in the United States, our lead privacy regulator, the FTC, actually has unfairness authority in addition to deceptiveness authority that could be brought to bear on issues like this. Um, and so my question is, does this right to reasonable, that is fair inferences, already exist in commercial unfairness doctrine? Or is the right that you're looking for something different? Those are some fantastic questions. Who would like to go first to respond? Uh, thanks on the on the fairness point. That's I, I agree. I think if I'd had my full talk, I would have been able to drill into it in a bit more detail. But I think you're right. I think fairness is a really important facet of reasonableness, because reasonableness has its own legal definition in the UK courts. But fairness has a very different role to play, and it particularly answers the freedom of expression point because. Privacy and privacy-related rights are not absolute, and neither is freedom of expression. They have to be balanced. And that's exactly what the court did in the Segalov case. They balanced the impact on the burden against the burden on the person that was trying to make the decision. And I think we just need more precedent and more cases to explain this. One of the problems we have with trying to get precedents in this field is trying to take on massive tech companies that are making these decisions. It's either financially difficult or it's hard to know that a decision's ever been made. So I think it comes back to this idea of access and the foundational rights to be able to make fairness a true right over data. Want to jump in as well? Um, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start with, with the fairness one and then just go through. I think it's reasonableness in my head means more than that. Um, so there, is, there are people that say that fairness in the GDPR doesn't mean anything because it doesn't have a definition attached to it. And I think there have been a couple of panels already to talk about the different problems that we have with what fairness actually means. And there's a whole field dedicated to the question what fairness me uh, means and libraries being filled by it. The other thing why I wouldn't just attach it to GDPR is because GDPR is not just about data protection. It's also about the free flow of data and enabling businesses. So what means fair in that direction? I could also say I draw those inferences to give you a better customer experience. That's fair, right? So I think it has to be more than that. I think that's not enough. And also I think the reasonableness question is not just linked to GDPR. What we are proposing is that reasonableness is a mixture between data protection right and the sector where you're deploying it. 
It could be what's reasonable depends on if it's criminal justice, is it advertisement, is it health? And look at the specific laws that we have there and the potential risks that we have there and then figure out what reasonableness is. I think just looking at data protection is probably not gonna be enough. Um, I understand the point with freedom of expression. And we also say in the paper that you have to balance this with other rights. I think the main problem is that freedom of expression is usually I tell you, I think you are, I don't know, I, I have a communication with you. You know what I think about you and then you have the ability to counter that in a way. With algorithms and trade secrets and not knowing and not having access, right, you don't even know what I think about you. So how is that actually freedom of expression? It's secrecy. Right? And what we're proposing is not necessary to say that you should always have an overriding right to reasonableness. It's about opening up a dialogue. I want to know what you know about me, and then I want to have the opportunity to tell you why I think you're wrong. That's the idea, basically. And I think that would balance a freedom of expression as well. And the, um, with regard to the purpose one, um, I think, again, this has been misused in the past, because I could also just tell you my purpose is to improve your customer experience, and this is what I need the data for, right? And very often this is seen as a transparency tool. We are pushing towards justification, right? We are moving towards a situation where it's not just informing you about what I'm doing, it's also justifying what I'm doing. And that has to happen before data processing actually happens, which is why I think we should have a discussion around what we want to see in an algorithmic society and what's reasonable to expect from algorithms. May I ask a very quick follow-up? Uh, please, can we answer first and then? Sure, we'll sure. Okay, yeah. Please. So I wanted to add to uh, uh, the points, the uh, excellent points made by the panel. Uh, in terms of freedom of expression, I think, as Sandra said, right, uh, if you're not able to communicate with the algorithms, if you don't know what they've inferred about you, if the opportunities visible to a person are restricted by the algorithm because of the profiling done at the back end, then it sort of uh, prohibits a person from sort of uh, exercising that right to freedom of uh, opportunities and creates disparate uh, effect on the population members. The other thing that I wanted to add to the discussion was that, you know, suppose I get a driving license for a car and I know how to drive a C-type vehicle, then I can say that, you know, using the same driving skills, I can probably drive a truck now, but that's clearly legal and that's not allowed. So I think the same thing should hold for algorithms. When they're taking data for a particular purpose and they've defined that purpose that the users are aware of, that data should not be used to be inferred for other purposes that uh, was not uh, specified in the application to begin with. Very good point. Thank you. On the, the point of purpose limitation, in our complaints, the, the key problem is that data brokers, but also ad tech companies, essentially do mass repurposing of data. So there is no clearly defined purpose for which these inferences are being used. And in fact, the real danger is that some inferences that you don't even know exist end up in the hands of actors that you really don't want them to end up in. So that is the key problem and the reason why uh, purpose limitation alone does not give that explanation. On the point of freedom of expression, this is something that's very dear to me personally, and I, I think we Privacy International doesn't work on freedom of expression, but we collaborate with others who do. And I started my presentation by a, a report we wrote on AI, together with an organization that works on freedom of expression, precisely because there is a tension between these two, and it is very, very crucial that we make sure that both of these are equally protected. Um, that said, I, I was very, I really, really liked the argument that Sandra just made on, 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 on the fact that look at the Quantcast data, the criteria data, these inferences, I, I, I find it very difficult to see that as a, as a freedom of expression, um, uh, as a free expression of, of opinion rather than a secretive class of mass profiling, classifying of people for uh, unclear purposes. There's a question from the floor. Very quick follow-up. So um, Sandra's response was in terms of fairness in the GDPR, but I wanted to clarify what I was asking about was fairness in commercial unfairness doctrine, both in the EU and in the US. And that is all about fairness, and that does have a, a long history of deciding what's fair and what's unfair. And, and so could that be a source, maybe not the right to reasonable inference, but perhaps a source even in litigation that parties could look to uh, in the, where these inferences are in the commercial context, credit, employment, insurance, et cetera, would it be you know, commercially unfair to make certain types of inferences and could that be a way of drawing this line? 
can I add another follow-up so you can double the response? So <clears throat> you're talking about reasonableness as a, a better protection than fairness. But what mischief does reasonableness seek to protect? Because reasonableness is a lower threshold than unfairness. Something can be unreasonable, but be quite a low thing. That's a matter of discretion. But if it's an unfair process, they got to that unreasonable decision, that's an easier thing to attack from a litigant's point of view. Um, so the way that we described it, we um, see fairness as a crucial component of reasonableness. So if something is unfair, it's automatically unreasonable. You know what I mean? It's it's not... It could be unfair but reasonable. Could be unfair. Could unfairly, the process could be unfair, but the end result could be reasonable. Yeah, so the idea is not... The, re the idea of reasonableness has nothing to do with the result itself, right? It's not about so much about if, if the... If the outcome is unreasonable. It's whether you should be doing the processing in the first place. It's about what is your purpose? What inference are you drawing? For what purpose? Is it legitimized to do that? Do you have any statistical validation for what you're doing, right? It's about not, it's actually we tr what we're trying to do is moving away from the ex post situation where I just tell you just an explanation or I just tell you about the result and you can. Uh, contest that result. I'm thinking about justification before inferences actually happen. So this is why I think it's more encompassing in a way um, that we sh should have a public discussion. Is it normatively acceptable? Is it ethically acceptable? And how does your identity, identity rights, privacy rights, um, freedom of expression rights relate to that? If that makes sense. Are there more questions from people who have not asked a question yet? Apologies to the person who's already asked two questions. Then I have a question also related to the freedom of expression dimension, which is quite interesting. When we're talking about freedom of expression, it seems like we're only talking about the freedom of expression of the people who are writing the algorithms. What about the freedom of expression of those groups whose voices are potentially chilled by being classified by those algorithms in a way that they no longer feel comfortable participating in public debate and not able to get access to services and not able to get access? Could that be a dimension of freedom of expression as well, though, where we need to think about the idea behind freedom of expression, just like we're talking about the idea behind privacy, which is to protect people rather than data, and also to protect individuals rather than just elements of speech. Is that sort of also a way of thinking differently about freedom of expression? I think that's a fantastic point. I think um, that is absolutely crucial because if you know that, for example, all your online behavior is being currently monitored and your clicking behavior is monitored and your mouse is being tracked and this is being used to make inferences about you, potentially make decisions about you, I have no intuitive link what my online behavior says about me, right? Is it good that I read The Guardian twice a week? How is it going to affect my credit rating, right? Should I read The Telegraph instead? Like, it's there's a potential chilling effect how I can exercise my own freedom of expression, access to information as well. If I'm using Facebook profiles and every, every time I interact with somebody on Facebook, that's being monitored. So yes, it's freedom of expression, it's freedom to information that could have a potential chilling effect. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you don't want to jump in, or do you want to jump in as well? Please. Uh, sure. So, um, exactly. So, yeah. So, this is what I was saying that, you know, the algorithms have sort of profiled uh, how what, what user behavior is, and this might be used to restrict access to certain uh, items or jobs or search results or opportunities or uh, restaurants even. Like Yelp shows us restaurants that are uh, sort of uh, close to us and they, they have a good reading, but they hide the information that, you know, what, did they actually get money from this restaurant to actually show that? And I may not even see some restaurants or I may not even see some job ads uh, based on uh, my past behavior on the internet. And imagine like if my browsing behavior or let's say the amount of time I spend on Facebook is given to my employers and my employers hey. say that, you know, we've run a regression model that shows that people who spend so much amount of time on Facebook should not get tenured and then uh, I'm denied tenure without knowing why that happened specifically because of the way I browsed, spent too much time on Facebook, right? So that's uh, exactly the right to... Uh, Don't worry, you said nothing wrong. It's got nothing to do with the lights. <laughs> it's all fine. Maybe we'll just go through a round. Oh, there's a question over here, please, and a question over here. Fantastic. Especially, I very much appreciate questions from people who haven't asked them yet, so the floor is yours. Okay, we have five um, more minutes. Yes, um, I'd like to ask about this concept from uh, John Cheney Lippold, uh, the measurable type. So the idea that this inference that's being made about us, <coughs> and especially when it's also, for example, a confidence interval, as in some of the cases uh, that Frederica told about, 
the point is maybe not so much that this uh, this predicate that's put on us is is wrong. Like I could be classified as a woman, and if that's a measurable type, if it's a measurement about me. It's, it says something about my behavior in the context of whatever that industry wants to uh, um, uh, wants to classify me. And I, I so I think this whole notion that it needs to correspond with our own perception of our own reality is not so much the case, uh, or not so much the essence of the problem. And I think that if, that it should be enough for me uh, to just say, I don't want to be measured at all in your measuring system, irrespective if the measurement corresponds or doesn't correspond with my view of my own reality. Um, and I want to ask the panelists what they think if this could be an, a, a useful way forward to think about uh, reasonableness or fairness. Thank you very much. We have a further question over here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so what I, I get that the notion of reasonableness really relates to the question of should we actually draw these kinds of inferences? But I wonder if we should translate such a question into an individual personal why that people can claim. So it sounds as if this is more something about a discussion that should happen within a profession or within society um, about the kind of business practices that we accept, but by making this into an individual personal why that people then can invoke in court, I'm not sure if that's the best way to move forward to have these type of discussions about the kind of inferences that we want organizations and companies to engage in. Yes. Short responses, please. No, yes, absolutely. I think we have to use, I mean, as a practitioner, we use the tools we have, but the, this is a systemic problem and that's what we're trying to challenge ultimately. To the related to both of these questions, I think the because there's so much focus on decisions rather than profiling, this is where lo lots of the discrimination and bias discussions have focused on. But the real question is, yes, I don't know why I have been classified as a rich or poor or whatever, but there's like, I need to know whether the company who's doing these inferences has taken any precautions to make sure that this is not systematically biased, precisely because it has an effect. I'm a bilingual user, what, how, how does this, change how I'm being classified like how is my German internet browsing interpreters and like all these it raises all these really interesting questions which boils down to why does a company I've never heard of have the right to put me in these boxes in the first place yeah. I, I think one positive example that I'll just briefly add here is Amazon's recommendation system where they're asking telling users that you know this item appeared on your news feed because you searched for this, and you can remove that search so that we don't show you things similar to this again. I think that's an excellent step forward in addressing the fact, uh, in sort of making these inferences more transparent to the customers so that they can edit it and affect the decisions of the algorithms in the future. Um, yeah, so I agree with what with, with both of you have said. Um, the idea is um, that, I, it was on the last slide, that we should have a dialogue what reasonable means, but the, the right, to leave it into individual level, right, just relates to what you said, that we need accountability mechanisms. We need to decide what's reasonable, and once we have that, you should have the ability to enforce it. That's the idea of it, right? So have a, have a discussion what's reasonable, what we want in a society, and once we have that, you should have the ability to enforce it in some way. And I also agree, that's exactly the point, right? Should you, it's not just about accuracy, it could be to some extent, because you could have a reasonable inference, if I'm inferring from your I know, saving history, something about your loan behavior, then accuracy might actually be a problem versus this is an unreasonable inference to draw in the first place, and please don't do that, right? I think both things have to be combined in a way. But yes, we need to have a discussion about what we want to see in, in, in an algorithmic scored society. I think just very quickly, so if it's a right, the burden falls on the data subject, and then it becomes their responsibility to try to enforce. The other problem you might have is, practically, if you go to a court, what form does the court order look like? And also, who do you enforce that on? Who do you serve the court order on? There's just very interesting practical questions to consider. So just to wrap up, because we have only 60 seconds left on this panel, I'd like to thank again all of the panelists here and also remind us that we're talking about issues where it's a lot of the time not just about coming 
from a very simplistic niche perspective of this is data or this is an element of a right, but always considering why do we have this right? Why do we have privacy? Why do we have freedom of expression? And always remembering that it's there to protect people, it's there to protect human beings, and specifically also often protect the most vulnerable and marginalized groups. And those groups need to be at the height of the mind we consider. Secondly, when we're talking about these issues, we always talk about accountability mechanisms. And I feel like we always turn to the law to fix our problems, and that seems to be too easy. We also need society, we also need technology, we also need politics to respond to this. If we build ideas of rights rather than accountability mechanisms to implement them, we won't actually get the rights that we believe we should have. So please join me in thanking our panelists.